Good afternoon. First of all, please follow my action. Raise your right hand. Hold your nose and hold your breath. So let us count how long you can hold your breath. Five seconds. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. I think it's enough. So this experiment tells you how important reading is to you. As a long burst for, to expel the carbon dioxide, to absorb the oxygen, to refresh the system. That's how important the green lung of the world is. So my story here is about how do we how attempt do we to save the world's forests. And every three years, sorry, uh, every year, the governments of the world would converge and to discuss about the issues of climate change. And three years ago, they converged in Paris and signed the historic Paris Agreement. The crux of the Paris Agreement is that the rise of the world's temperature cannot go beyond 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, beyond which at 3 degrees Celsius at 4 degrees there will be a total disaster afflicting planet Earth. So it is how important for us to keep the forest, to, to keep the climate you know, stable. Now central to the Paris Agreement is Article, Article 4, which is to retain and protect our forests. So my talk here today is about closer at home, how do we combat the loss of forests in the island of Borneo, the third largest island in the world. So this map here shows the inconvenient truth. From the turn of the last century, the amount of forest left that we have has gone down to 71% in the year 2005. And just two years ago, in our latest analysis of the satellite imagery, the forest that's left is 40 million hectares, or 55%. So what you see in the grey colour are the areas that have been deforested before 2005. The yellow and the orange colour are those areas that have been deforested over the last 15 years. And the dark green colours are the what we have left in Borneo. Now the good news is, the governments recognise the importance of forests. So they have acted to protect our forests by ensuring that this is kept pristine. And this is in a dark colour and they comprise like 31% of the forested areas or 70% of the total land mass in Borneo. Now, in addition, they have also kept something like 19.5 million hectares or 49% of the forested areas as production forests. So this allows the governments and the industry to harvest our natural resources in a sustainable manner. However, not all is good. Of the 40 million hectares that have been designated as protected areas, or production forests, 8 million hectares remain unprotected. And under business as usual, 6 million hectares will be lost over the next uh, 6 years up to 2025. So it's so important that these remaining forests that we have remain protected and be, set and be uh, put into production forests. So how do we, WWF, do to help the governments to combat this loss of forests and to protect them. We undertake three fundamental approaches, which is protect and manage the forests that we have, and restore areas that have been degraded. And importantly, out of these three approaches is to identify where these areas are, how do we do that, and with whom do we work with. In these aspects, WRF works with the governments of Borneo through the Heart of Borneo Corridor Project. The Heart of Borneo Initiatives is the declarations of the three governments of Brunei Darussalam, Indonesia and Malaysia to ensure that 22 million hectares of the most important areas of Borneo remain forest and remain conserved for the importance of biodiversity and the ecosystem services that provides for the, for the, for the peoples in the island. I would like to show a video now which shows the importance of the Heart of Borneo Corridor Project.
So as you can see, there are many protected areas in Borneo and there are already projects that attempt to link them one by one to prevent these protected areas from being isolated as islands. So the initiative of the Corridor Project is to link up these various existing projects into a totality. And these are the protected areas in the heart of Borneo that will be connected. Yeah, all these names are being shown here. And once all these areas are connected with a contiguous forest belt, the well-managed forest it provides a space and a foundation for the conservation of the biodiversities. They are also the important sources of the major rivers in Borneo. In Borneo, we have 22 major watersheds and most of them lie within the heart of Borneo. So this corridor ensures that all these areas are well connected. Apart from that, it's also the homes of the people living there. And these are the various names of the various local communities that live in Borneo. So in a sense, this corridor project that links between various protected areas allows us so allows us to ensure that all these vital areas for connectivity are well managed. And from here, I would like to share my my personal journey from how I I become an anthropologist and later I turn my expertise into a conservationist. After my form six. I followed the church mission to the interior of Sarawak. I visited the people and I fell in love with the culture of the people, the heritage that they have, and they live around the pristine forests and the nice rivers. And my heart broke when the people told me that over the next few years, all these areas will be dammed by the hydropower project. So I was determined to help them and took up a discipline that will enable them to, to, to go through the ravages of rapid development. And this discipline is called anthropology. So I took on my master's degree and eventually my PhD. For a couple of years, I was studying the local community. And once, when I finished my PhD thesis, I was invited by the Malaysian German Technical Project to be the social economic advisor for a forest management project. The idea is that with a well-managed forest, the, the forests will remain intact, the rivers will remain clean. However, that was not so. The local communities, especially the Penan people living in the forest, could not believe that the company will transform itself to, to protect the environment. So they put up blockages, send message to the governments and the company that we do not want logging to come into our area. And through series of discussion and demands put up, the two governments of Malaysia and Germany decided that the project cannot, be, cannot progress beyond and eventually decided to terminate the project. Now, the story is that this is a conflict area and through my engagement with conflict resolution, I was awarded a lifetime fellowship to understand conflicts further. And this program brought me to the mountains of Thailand and Indonesia Borneo to do research on forestry conflicts. And from that experience, I found that there are basically there are three, categor three categories of conflicts. Those that can be resolved, therefore it's called conflict resolution. And there are others that cannot be resolved, but you need to manage them. You bring the conflict parties together, and through the right approaches, through dialogues, you can eventually manage the conflicts. So it's called conflict management. In other areas, the conflict parties are so acrimonious that they refuse to see one another. Yet they are there. So what do we do then do? We do various approaches, we hold dialogues, we change the system so that the causes that uh, bring forth towards conflict can be, re can be addressed. And this is what we call by conflict transformation. Because you can't resolve the conflicts, but you can transform that relationship. And from there, I then work uh, with a government-linked organization called Throughout Forestry. My responsibility to adopt and to develop mechanisms that allow local communities to participate in forest management. And in about 2009, 
I led a joint WWF Throat Forestry uh, project on determining high conservation value forests, or called SCVF. SCVF provides a tool to address forest management and identify the needs of the local communities. So through these assessments of, and of the needs of the people, we found what are important to the local community and recommended to the companies to adopt measures that ensure that these resources are protected. And at the end, we managed to help the company build a good relationship with the local community. And since then, in 2012, I joined uh, WWF as head of conservation for Sarawak. So my responsibility is, is in, a, in addition to looking into the needs of the local community, but also to design strategies that in the conservations of the wider landscapes be adopted by the company and the government. From then on, we work with the three member countries of Brunei, Malaysia and Indonesia to identify what are, the, what are the issues that are important for the island. And that gave rise to the Heart of Bono Corridor project that I was talking about earlier. And arising from there, the governments eventually invited WWF to work on this project and to ensure that all the various stakeholders, the various communities in these areas are able to come together. But to implement such a large project, it requires a lot of financial resources, technical expertise to come together. And we are talking about an area that, that encompasses 2,000 kilometers long, connecting the protected areas from north of Borneo in Sabah down to central Kalimantan in, in Indonesia. And it encompasses some six priority areas that WWF have identified with the governments. These six priority areas are vital for the conservation of biodiversity and the protection of ecosystem services. So the video clip that you saw earlier, are those are the places that they need to work with. And they involve multiple resource use. It cuts across international boundaries, provincial boundaries, administrative boundaries. So it requires a system that all these various stakeholders can come together and work with. So we have been invited by the governments to work on this project at the fundraise. And with that mandate and that responsibility to given to us, we have designed this project called the Heart of Borneo Green Investment Fund. It is the attempt to raise sufficient resources to implement large-scale conservation project. And when we look into various funding resources around the world, we look into existing government projects, the appetite of the private sector to invest, the philanthropies they are willing to put um, the donations into, into conservation. We also look into various funding organizations around the world. So this table here shows, for instance, the Green Climate Fund, the the GGF, the Global Environmental Facilities, that provides funding amounting to from five to two hundred fifty million dollars project. So it's through these configurations of funds around the world, from private sector, that we decided that we need to raise an amount of about two hundred and fifty million to work on. Now, large scale conservation projects requires the collaboration and cooperation of three main sectors, the government, the private sectors, and other players, the local communities and NGOs. So it's important that there's a cross collaboration. So the, the civil society then works to develop conservation plans to communicate this out to the various institutions and private sector, and to ask the private companies to adopt these plans and work with governments to endorse these conservation plans. And from this kind of collaboration, cooperation, working together, it is highly possible that the amount of money that is, that is um, involved in conservation can be raised. So this pyramid shows the configuration of funding that is required. The top part talks about governments to governments uh, collaboration, uh, which, is, which actually drive the biggest amount of fundings. And some of this project can only be uh, applied by governments so what we as civil society do is to support the governments in proposal development and work with the private sectors to fundraise through investments, through philanthropy and so on. So what I would like to say is that 
by having this idea of, of uh, working with governments, various institutions to address our problems of deforestation, it has allowed me to take part in this project, be champion of the Heart of Bono Corridor project, and that has brought me to many international conferences, including the, the, the climate change conference that I mentioned in, in Paris, and it allows me to be invited to give messages as keynote speaker. And we also have been involved in the organization of a uh, summit that was organized three weeks ago with, the, with Prince Charles and the Sultan of Perak. And in this event, we managed to convene uh, captains of the industries, uh, chairman of banks, CEOs, head of government departments, civil society, and so on, to work with the governments to address issues pertaining to conservation. And together with my CEO, we were able to bring these ideas forth with various stakeholders and come up with resolutions. And what is of gratitude to us is that the Perak government adopted a declaration committing the, the entire state of Perak to support tiger conservation. And lastly, I would like to say to you that if we work together, we can resolve issues as big as climate change that the governments of the world converge every year to address. In many, many international conferences, the climate change conference bring about the bigger sector of, of, of government officers and stakeholders because everything pertaining to climate change affects our life. It requires the industry to adopt activities that reduces pollution. It requires us to produce green technology to address uh, technological issues. It requires competing resource use between forests and land to be managed in such a way that the pollution is reduced, forest is retained. It requires we, you, as consumers to ensure that we do not uh, over-consume our resources. WWF and institutions have worked that the way that we live on, the amount of resources that the planet Earth can replenish will never be enough. So my last message to you as students, as leaders of the future is to identify through your various expertise that, and the knowledge, knowledge that you acquired to identify problems that can resolve the world's future, uh, problems in the future. And climate change is an issue that nobody of us can escape. And it's our responsibility to identify specific issues, areas of specialization that we can eventually work on to resolve the, the problems that we will face in the future. Thank you very much.